more nurture you have, the more nature you need to have it. And this is the game changer. It's also what's incredibly frightening. Modify the genomes of twin girls in China, implanted them, um, and these babies have now been born. We don't speak gene well enough to write really dangerous stuff yet. In 10 years, we've solved the genome. We've got the structure of DNA. We've solved the genetic program, how it works. And it's the regulation of these genes that's much more complex in humans that we're trying to understand. So to understand genes, you have to understand DNA. DNA is, of course, the molecule whose structure was elucidated by Jim Watson and Francis Crick. It forms a double helix. And what does DNA stand for? I spoke to a school last week, and um, I was advised to tell them that it stood for do not ask. <laughs> but it actually stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, it's a very long, thin molecule. We, every cell of our body has two meters of it, and um, it lies in every nucleus of our cell. And it's made up of three billion bases, which is the alphabet of DNA, and there's only four bases within, um, within that alphabet. So genes, are like, uh, genes lie on, um, within DNA like beads on a string, and they're made up of different combinations of bases. Uh, so all the genes and the intervening DNA, we don't know, often we don't know what it does, it's called the genome, and you'll hear a lot about the genome, and that's what we talk about when we say we're going to sequence the genome. Um, so the genome actually is broken up into 23 chromosomes, so 23 different rods. Um, we also thought of DNA encoding RNA, which encodes protein. That was the central dogma, and protein is what gives us our eye color and so on. Um, we now know there are genes that make RNA, and they don't make proteins. Uh, these non-coding RNAs are very important for regulating genes, and you'll probably hear more about this um, when you hear about epigenetics. But ultimately, it's the gene that determines what goes on downstream. Um, one other fact is that uh, genes, we've inherited one gene from our mother and one from our father. And genes can differ subtly between individuals because of the slightly different bases. And these are term mutations. A lot of these are term mutations. Some of these mutations can lead to disease, and others can have a more subtle effect on our appearance or behavior. And often that's cumulative. And when you hear about the complexity, it's that complexity of multiple genes acting together that is very hard to work out. But we are starting to work it out. Um, so the point of the Genome was, uh, Project was to understand the sequence of the three billion bases that made up DNA, and then find out where the genes lay. And later studies have looked into regions of DNA that actually regulate genes. So the Genome Project surprises us all by, sh by showing us that we only have about as many genes as a fruit fly, or, a, or a, a, a worm that Sidney Brenner was working on. And it's the regulation of these genes that's much more complex in humans that we're trying to understand. Also, only 3% of our DNA actually codes for genes. 3% is known to be regulatory. We don't know what the rest is. Um, it, that was called junk DNA, but, but it may not be junk. Um, as Sidney Brenner said, you take out, you throw away the trash, but you put the junk in the attic. So, you know, you want to know what, we still don't know exactly what that junk does, but I think it does something. Um, so it's also only during d disease and aging that we see alterations in the epigenome, and you'll hear about that. So epigenetic changes are not heritable, usually, and they're modified after birth due to the environment or are genetically programmed. And it's the gene that sets up both the epigenetic alterations and the um, morphogenetic fields. You, you said that the genes, um, they determine what happens downstream. Are you saying basically that the causality goes to the gene and everything else that happens flows from the gene, from the that, if we use an up-down metaphor, from the bottom up? Is that I that's quite a strong statement? I am saying that. Um, now, uh, there are, you can have modifications to the DNA itself through environment, for example. So there can be modifications that way, and that's what you'll hear about with epigenetics. But it's still the gene that has been modified. Inherited DNA differences is the major systematic influence making us who we are as individuals. You say genes, and people think of hardwired puppeteers making us do things, you know, deterministic. And 
Part of that's because we learn about genetics from Mendel. And Mendel, if you remember, did experiments with pea plants. And he was essentially studying single gene mutations in pea plants. If you were a pea plant, you like your seeds to be nice and round and smooth. There's a mutation, a single gene mutation, that causes them to be wrinkled. So that these single gene mutations are deterministic and hardwired and necessary and sufficient. For humans, there are maybe seven, 8,000 single gene disorders. Most of them, thankfully, are very rare. But if you had one of these, like on the tip of chromosome four, you know, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, the tip of chromosome four has a gene that if, 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 if it, you receive the, inherit, uh, the mutated version of it, you have Huntington's disease, which is a, a neurological degeneration that happens later in life. And if you have that mutation, you will die from Huntington's. It doesn't matter what your environment is, your exercise regime, your food, it will kill you. It's necessary and sufficient. And so those are very important for the people who get them. But what we've learned in the last decade is that that's not where most of the genetic influence comes from for complex traits, like those who study in psychology and common disorders, like in medicine, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, for example. There's strong genetic influence, but there's no evidence for major gene effects. That is, any one bit of DNA is making a huge difference. What it's about, this heritability, is about thousands of tiny DNA differences that together have an impact on a disorder. So that's a whole new ball game. You know, single gene genetics would be rather simple. You just find the gene, you find out what it does wrong, and you try to change it, although we're not very good at doing those things. But here, we've got thousands of little DNA differences that are making you predisposed, say, to schizophrenia, or in my case, to obesity. And um, it's a, it makes it go from a deterministic, hardwired, single gene concept to a probabilistic propensity. And that's what's hard for people to understand. When you say twin studies, people actually mean a much more common experiment where you have identical twins, a third of all twin births, 1% of all births are twins, a third of those are identical twins, which are monozygotic clones of one another. They have the same DNA. The other group, though, are fraternal twins, and it's like a biological experiment. These are both sets of twins are born in the same womb, raised in the same family. But one group, identical twins, are twice as similar genetically. So if a trait like, say, body mass index is heritable, you'd have to predict identical twins are more similar than non-identical twins. There's also an adoption method, which is important because it's completely different. It's a social experiment where kids who are adopted away at birth are followed with their adoptive parents. So you've got parents who share nurture, but not nature with their kids, the adoptive parents. And you have parents who share heredity, nature, but not nurture with their adopted away offspring. So just taking body mass index to make this concrete to people, the correlation for identical twins for body mass index is about 0.75 um, and for non-identical twins is about 0.35. So it's maybe- just, just to explain that, the correlation, that means that 75% of it is genetic, is nature, and 25% no. nurture for the identical twins. It's about individual differences in a population. And so it's saying identical twins are more similar than non-identical twins. They both share environment, so their similarity could be due to environment. But if it's genetic, you'd expect the identical twins to be much more similar than fraternal twins because identical twins are 100% similar genetically, fraternal twins 50%. So with that difference, you can estimate that the heritability, that is the extent to which inherited DNA differences account for differences in BMI, body mass index, is about 70% which people find shocking. If you ask the, your audience how heritable is it, they'd estimate about 30%. So it's twice as heritable as they think. But what's really neat is the adoption method com completely converges on that. I did, your parents and children correlate about 0.35 for body mass index. It could be nature or nurture. For a century, people assumed it's nurture. Makes sense. Families provide the food and style, lifestyles and exercise. But children adopted away from their birth parents at birth, never seeing them again, correlate 0.35, the same with their birth parents. Adopted children, their correlation with their adoptive parents who rear them 
for body mass index is zero. Wow. So that's an example of where what's running in families is nature, genetics, not nurture, but the environment's important. What's really impressive about identical twins reared apart is you know, they're raised in uncorrelated environments and they're very, very similar. Inherited DNA differences is the major systematic influence making us who we are as individuals, but it's the best evidence we have for the importance of the environment. However, the environment doesn't work the way we thought it worked from Freud onwards. It's not nurture in the sense of systematic family environmental influences. It's something else. And we don't really know what that something else is, but after 30 years of trying to find this something else, I've come to conclude these are idiosyncratic, stochastic, chance sorts of events. It's not that they're unimportant, it's just that we don't have control over them. And it's important for parents to know that they have much less control over their children's ultimate outcome than they think. First, because genetics is the major systematic force. Secondly, the environmental influences aren't the levers that they can control. Professors are inclined to attribute the intelligence of their children to nature and of their students to nurture. So the idea that nature and nurture are alternatives poisoned a lot of debates in the 20th century, and I hope it doesn't have to poison debates in the 21st, because it is not a zero-sum thing, it's not a spectrum from one to the other, and it's not one as an alternative to another. Indeed, as William James said right at the start of the debate, and I think I wish we'd listened to this more, the more nurture you have, the more nature you need to have it, and vice versa. Here's an example. Monkeys are not innately afraid of snakes. A monkey born in the lab shown a snake uh, for the first time is not frightened of it. But it's much easier to teach a monkey fear of snakes than to teach it fear of flowers. And this was the result of a brilliant experiment by Susan Minaker in which she dubbed a video so that the monkey saw another monkey being frightened of a snake, but actually she'd put a flower over the snake on the video so the monkey thought the other monkey was terrified of flowers. And all it learnt was that some monkeys are bonkers. <laughs> the more we lift the lid on genes, the more we find that they are actually open to experience. They take their cues from what happens to us. If you remember this talk that I'm giving right now, it will be because inside your brain cells, genes are being switched on and off for fractions of a second to alter the strength of connections between nerve cells to lay down a new, new memory. That's what genes are actually doing. They're, they're often um, literally turning on and off during our lifetimes, and they're at the mercy of what happens to us. So nurture can be fate, and nature can be malleable. And as Marianne said, the idea that the left believes in nurture while the right believes in nature, I think is just plain empirically wrong if you look at what people actually do, because the left believes in tapping talent among underprivileged people, finding the bright kid and giving her opportunity. And that only makes sense if you believe there are such things as bright kids. Whereas the right only believes in edu or the right believes in education. And that only makes sense if you think nurture is necessary as well as nature. Uh, or to put it more bluntly, as someone said to me, professors are inclined to attribute the intelligence of their children to nature and of their students to nurture. By doing that, the DNA gets repaired, introduces the change, and voila, you have an edited gene. CRISPR allows for what's called gene editing. And gene editing is this new version of genetic engineering <laughs> that's quite inexpensive, easy to use, and very specific in how it works. So up until now, most genetic engineering techniques have resulted, for example, in huge swaths of DNA being changed in the process of making a genetic change. CRISPR has been likened to like genetic scissors in that you can go into the DNA of, of literally any little living thing and change it to the very single base, base pair of the code of DNA. This is pretty, this is significant, this is big. And we're seeing CRISPR emerge in all sorts of places, whether it's human, healthcare, whether it's industry, agriculture. And we're also seeing it starting to emerge in places where generally genetic engineering would have been cross prohibitive or too difficult, places like public health and environmental conservation. And the way that it works, because I think this is important, just I need to, I'm going to give you a quick science lesson so we can all be on the same page and then you can go to your next dinner party and just really blow everyone's mind. <laughs> um, 
But basically, CRISPR is so easy to use because it really only requires two components. One is this little blue guy, which is called the guide RNA. So the guide RNA is going to be a specific sequence that can recognize whatever sequence of the DNA that you're trying to change. So if that sequence of the DNA perhaps has the single base change that causes sickle cell disease, you would create the sequence that recognizes that to go to that mutation and, and want to change it. And so the guide RNA localizes the place of DNA that you want to change. And this, which looks much different in real life under microscopes, is a, an enzyme called Cas9. And what this does is it cuts DNA. This is an absolute nightmare for any cell. When its DNA is cut, it wants to repair it immediately. And so what you can do is you can kind of usurp that DNA repair process by introducing a DNA template of whatever you want to introduce into this genetic sequence. It could be changing the sequence. It could be adding an entirely new sequence. It could be removing sequence from the DNA. And by doing that, the DNA gets repaired, introduces the change, and voila, you have an edited gene. Obviously, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but this is sort of really how it works. And this is what's, this is what's become so revolutionary in the genetic engineering space. As I mentioned, the ease of use of this has allowed it to be entering into totally new ways of solution making or things that we previously would have been thinking it couldn't be effective for. Agriculture is one. I think we can all kind of jump to the quick conclusion of what this is looking at. This is thinking about using this for genetically engineered crops, thinking about using this to remove certain pests. Um, environmental conservation is another. So for example, people are discussing, could we use CRISPR gene editing to give coral different kinds of genetic sequences that make them resilient to warming sea temperatures? Could we use CRISPR gene editing to suppress the emerald ash borer by introducing sterility into that population in North America and saving the ash tree? The other places this being explored is within the public health space. So there's discussions around, can we use CRISPR gene editing to, to suppress the malaria species, the malaria carrying species of mosquito? So this is some big, these are really big ideas and it's, and it's, not, it's not fully theoretical anymore. I think that's important that we all understand sort of the status of where this is. And the one that I want everyone to also be aware of is this project that's funded by the Gates Foundation. This is a uh, initiative called Target Malaria. And they are using CRISPR gene editing to create a, a line of mosquitoes that when released into the wild would suppress the mosquito population that carries malaria and hoping to save human life. And they do this because not only does CRISPR allow you to make really easy gene edits in any living thing, it's also allowed for the production of what's called a CRISPR-based gene drive. Because if you think about it, if anyone remembers their natural bio their biology training from way back when, things work through natural selection, right? So if you're going to release a, a mosquito that has some gene in it that you want to push through a species population, it's going to go mate with a wild mosquito. There's going to be only 50% of inheritance of those genes. And eventually, through natural selection, it's quite likely that mosquito would get pushed out of the population and you wouldn't really change anything. What a gene drive does is this gene drive mosquito not only expresses the gene edit that you want. So say it's to push sterility through this mosquito spot population to suppress the population. It also expresses all of the tools, the CRISPR, so the Cas9, the garden RNA, the stuff that we talked about on that previous slide, <laughs> So that it makes those very same edits in the wild gene that it inherits from, from its wild parent. So this gene drive mosquito is going to mate with the wild, wild parent. The child inherits the gene edited gene from the gene drive parents as well as the CRISPR to then edit the same gene in the wild parent. And through that, you get 100% of inheritance of a gene. And over time, every single mosquito in a population will have that gene edit that you acquire. And this is the game changer. This is what's both exciting because it means you can transform populations of, of species if you're trying to try and create a solution for something. It's also what's incredibly frightening. You can completely alter a, na a natural wild species by releasing just a few of these gene drive mosquitoes. The dialogue about what this means for humanity was happening at the same time. This uh, technology now which we can, um, is revolutionary in its ability to allow us to modify genomes of things of interest, like mice or, or cells or whatever it is, um, was not born of someone trying to find a new technology with which to modify genomes. It was born from the work of people who were just investigating what bacteria did 
And, and it was through that that essentially they understood more about it and then they established, oh, look, these bacteria have this mechanism. It's to protect themselves from viruses. How does that work? Oh, well, it, look, it, it has this thing and it can, oh, look, that means it could be programmed. And if you can program it, you can, you know, it's a tool. And then, and it's been really interesting actually because this was at least, you know, I'm, I'm still relatively young, so I don't know if this is common or not, but I don't think it is so much. Namely, in the same time at which we started discussing this technology and saying, wow, look at what we can now achieve in the lab, the dialogue about what this means for humanity, right, was happening at the same time. So it was it found from interest, developed as a tool for modifying the genomes of mice that we use to model human diseases. And then, of course, uh, last year, last January, uh, the headlines broke that somebody in China had actually used this technology to uh, modify the genomes of twin girls in China, implanted them, um, and these babies have now been born. And I feel like that's a little case in point of the whole scientific process and the sort of worries that we have, because on one hand, this person did that, and on the other hand, scientists like me have a really great tool with which we can do better experiments now. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think Luke's totally right, and, and um, education is clearly key, and regulation is clearly somewhere very important in this because you know individuals can do it that the case in china was an individual i mean but does that mean that everybody else should be deprived of something that is good in their hands we now effectively have a typewriter for gene language crispr cas9 is an example where we got lucky because crispr cas9 showed up at a point we now effectively have a typewriter for gene language, but we don't have a Rosetta Stone for it. So the point is we are held back because we don't speak gene well enough to write really dangerous stuff yet. We will ultimately, but we don't. So we now get time to deal with the frightening prospect without having that power at our disposal. Each child born into the world is a unique, uh, untested genetic experiment. Do we think that it is ethically permissible to conduct uh, untested genetic experiments creating a child with a genetic disorder uh, because that essentially is what sexual reproduction is. I mean each child born into the world is a unique uh, untested genetic experiment. Um, one doesn't know what is going to happen um, and in the course of a lifetime that child will probably undergo all, all kinds of suffering and eventually die uh, from old age or one of the diseases of old age. So personally, I'm a, an antinatalist. However, the future does not belong to uh, antinatalists. It belongs to fanatical life lovers. And I think that if one does believe it is ethically justifiable to create new life, then one has an ethical obligation to maximize the opportunity for one's child or children to flourish. Uh, and so as a transhumanist, I would support universal access to pre-implantation genetic screening and counselling for all prospective parents. Um, yes, that may involve artificial wombs, but uh, nat nat natural wombs too. Um, because as molecular biology teases out the genetic basis of pain, misery, suffering, pain, uh, pain thresholds, Essentially, yes, it's going to be able. It, we're going to be able to replace today's genetic crapshoot um, with with something more civilized. Um, already, we have the first uh, CRISPR uh, babies in China. Unfortunately, uh, rather than uh, essentially improving the well-being of the children in question, it was really a kind of uh, experiment, nominally to. Uh, uh, essentially protect the children from HIV in, in practice in animal models the genetic mutation in question uh, actually enhances cognition the rogue scientist was probably trying to create smart babies but my, but my, my, my point here is that yeah something like pain sensitivity for example there is a so-called volume knob for pain the FCN9A gene and if, if, if one thinks it justifiable to have a child, one can choose the approximate pain uh, threshold, pain sensitivity of your future child, ranging from nonsense mutations, no pain at all, to high to low pain thresholds. Um, and so 
uh, just to conclude, yes, I very much uh, hope that we can move uh, to a society of truly planned par parenthood in which all babies are, to use this rather unfortunate label, designer bab babies rather than these uh, untested genetic experiments that we have now. Nature has designed this in such a way that we adjust to the unexpected. The notion that we are already on the way to eugenics in the traditional sense, I object to that strongly. And there are all kinds of reasons to object to it. First of all, to begin to manipulate the information that is passed between generations, the information that leads to the generation of our species, and begin to interfere with the diversity in man, that's simply wrong. And first of all, because for us to continue to adjust to the world we live in, you know, nature has designed this in such a way that we adjust to the unexpected. And today we cannot predict what's going to happen tomorrow. If we are going to eradicate certain aspects of Homo sapiens through what you guys call eugenics, make absolutely sure you know what you're doing. Imagine if rather than a Newton or an Einstein every century, we had many of them in every generation. As a libertarian myself, I think there's been much too much emphasis on the libertarian aspects of the debates surrounding designer babies, because then you get concerned of the world drifting towards something. What I'd like to do is emphasize a few points about the communitarian and egalitarian benefits of designing babies that may make an argument for running toward it rather than being concerned that we're drifting toward it. First, designer babies hold the promise of making the world better, even for those who eschew the practice. Imagine if rather than a Newton or an Einstein every century, we had many of them in every generation. How many diseases might we cure with this knowledge? How many insoluble scientific or social problems might we fix? However much Shakespeare or Edison might benefit from their own accomplishments, the rest of us benefit too. And in that sense, a rising tide raises all ships. Second, designer babies hold the promise of creating a more equitable society. This may seem counterintuitive to a lot of people, but at present, we already grant considerable advantage to those who are well healed. Um, if you can hire an academic tutor, you can get into a fancy university. If you can hire a tennis coach for your kids, they can play at Wimbledon. Um, and that compounds underlying biological injustices. My sense is that everyone on this call has a rather significant gift of intelligence. Um, having worked with patients whose IQs are in the 75 to 80 range, the world is much harder for them. We should make it easier, but that's also a significant burden to bear. If we lived in a remotely equitable world, where there were any promise of us reaching that point sometime soon, there might be a compelling argument for limiting these sorts of reproductive interventions, but we don't. And with that in mind, designer babies may be the best opportunity we have to create this equality. They might be the great equalizer. So my goal with the underlying premise that these are inevitable, if you look at what happened in China with germline editing, eventually somebody will begin designing babies in the way that I am talking about. We wanna make sure that resources are devoted to making everyone have an equal opportunity and to making sure that the people who don't avail themselves of this opportunity have their rights protected. The problem with molecular biology is not that it's mechanistic, it's crypto-vitalist. I don't have any problem with the Genome Project. I think it gives us in interesting and sometimes useful information. I sent off for a 23andMe £125 sequencing. I was hoping to announce the results here for myself. <laughs> they, unfortunately, they take six weeks, so I can't. So, you know, not against it, but I just think what we have is a problem of enormous hype and a completely unrealistic expectation of it. When I was an undergraduate at Cambridge in 1963, not quite as long ago as the model of the heartbeat in 1960, <laughs> um, um, I was re reading biochemistry and Francis Crick and Sidney Brenner invited five or six of us from the part two biochemistry class to a series of evening seminars. They were grooming us to become molecular biologists. Um, and basically they said, you know, in 10 years we've solved the genome, we've got the structure of DNA, we've solved the genetic program, how it works, the, the, um, the coding uh, thing. And basically they said, 
The unsolved problems of biology are essentially development and consciousness. They haven't been solved yet because the people who have been working on them uh, were not molecular biologists, nor were they very clever. They said, <laughs> but we're going to solve them within 10 or 20 years. And uh, Bredner said, I'm taking development, and Crick said, I'm taking consciousness. <laughs> and, uh, and they invited us to join them. Well, I, didn't, I wasn't persuaded by them about the power of this. But um, the, the exaggeration of the role of genes, the selfish gene idea, for example, a gene for things with selfish replications, genetic programs, these are all vitalist fantasies, in my opinion. The problem with molecular biology is not that it's mechanistic, it's crypto-vitalist. And by attributing these you know, selfish properties to genes or programs which are intelligently designed by human programmers, I think of fantasies projected onto genes. And I think they've led to an enormous distortion of priorities in biology. I do have a slight vested interest here because in 2009 I took part in a debate with Lewis Walpert, who's a leading uh, materialist and mechanist at Cambridge at the Science Festival on the Nature of Life. And Lewis said, um, within, he said, it won't be long before, given the genome of a, of a baby, of a, a fertilized egg, we'll be able to predict every detail of the ensuing child. And I said, Lewis, I, I, how long do you think that's going to take? I said, you said soon. I said, what, 10 years? He said, well, well, not 10 years, 20. No, well, well maybe a century. And I said, well, that's a really, really long time. This is promissory, mater promissory materialism in an extreme form. I said, can we have, uh, I said, I bet you uh, that it won't be possible uh, even with a simpler organism within 20 years. And he said, well, I'm sure it will. So we have a wager. It was published in New Scientist. The one thing we could easily agree on was the stake. We wanted something that would increase in value over 20 years rather than decrease, like money. So it's a case of fine port. We paid half each. Uh, it's in the Wine Society vaults. Um, and uh, so the wager is that by May the 1st, 2029, Walpert said, given the fully sequenced genome of a fertilized egg, we'll be able to predict every detail of not a human, but at first he said, a chick. So I said, OK, Lewis, a chick. So then he rang me a week later and said, well, I've discovered a chick would be a bit too complicated. It'll have to be a frog. <laughs> so I said, all right, a frog. A chick or a frog. And then after a week, he rang me and he said, I, I, I think even the frog's a bit too complicated. <laughs> so it's going to have to be a nematode worm. Um, Sino rebditis elegans. And I said, well, that's a big step down. I said, well, <laughs> if we're going to a millimeter long worm, then at least we should spell out that to do this, you've got to predict the structure of every protein based on the primary structure of the protein, the sequence of amino acids, the, th the threefold folded up structure. And he got back to me about a week. He said, can we just miss out the protein folding thing? <laughs> I understand there's a bit of a problem predicting the ter tertiary structure of a protein from the primary structure. I said, yes, there is. I mean, that's the reason why this isn't going to work. And um, so he, he, he said, well, anyway, um, well, let's just uh, leave it open. Can it be any organism? Uh, so the wager is by 2029, uh, it should be possible to predict on the basis of the genome, the structure of any organism, uh, 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 any multicellular organism. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.